On a beautiful summer morning back in 1992, a young mum was taking a walk on Wimbledon Common with her two-year-old son. The South London beauty spot was a favourite place for families, but it was about to become the scene of one of Britain's most notorious murders. The young mother was brutally murdered in broad daylight, just a few hundred yards the from the... savagery train. of this murder has shocked even the most hardened detectives. She was found she with her throat her. slashed. She'd been sexually assaulted. The victim was 23-year-old Rachel Nickell. Retired architect Michael Murray was the first to discover her body. As I walked along, I noticed a pair of bare legs sticking out towards the path. And I thought, to begin with, this must be a, a, a sun, sunbather. And as I drew closer, I realized that this was something uh, quite different. A girl lying semi-naked, blood all over the place, and um, that her eyes were uh, very stony and uh, glazed. And I noticed then her small boy, about two years old, um, pulling at her arm, trying to get her to get up because the poor little chap was uh, crying and uh, almost hysterical. Alex, just weeks short of his third birthday, was the only witness to his mother's brutal murder. You know, it was one of those murders where I think it struck into everyone the thought that this could be anybody's daughter, anybody's wife. Uh, and it was just so, you know, it was... A, it was one of those cases that really caused people, even in, a, in, a, in an environment like the Daily Mirror newsroom, to stop and say, this is absolutely dreadful. You know, how, how on earth has this happened? Who on earth could have done it? From the outset, there was immense pressure on the police to get a result. Just some frenzied attack on an, on an unsuspecting uh, woman uh, that I've seen. One of the first things that people like me think in those circumstances is are the police considering that this might be part of another series of attacks? More worryingly, does it herald the beginning of a series of attacks? You know, is, do we have a serial killer on the loose? Because experience tells us that this is a kind of crime that may well be part of a serial. In fact, there was a serial rapist on the loose, but with few clues, police asked Andre Hanscom, Rachel's partner, to appeal for help. Somebody must know something. Um, from the ferocity of the attack. So now I couldn't have just walk down the road and not be noticed. And I would say to anybody who does know this person, no matter how they feel about them, now please come forward before he destroys anybody else's life. Andre was working as a dispatch rider when he heard the news. I rang home, as I did every day, a couple of times a day, and a strange voice picked up the phone and I immediately knew that it was an official voice something in the tone something in the circumstances made me just let me know that this was this was a policeman or this was some kind of official and I immediately lost my call and demanded that he tell me what what was going on where was she and he said I can't tell you I can't tell you um, Something's happened to her, and I said, she's dead, isn't she? Because there would be absolutely no other reason for him to not tell me what had happened. And he said, I can't tell you. I said, you already have. And uh, I said, Alex, and uh, he said, he's okay, he's okay. And I collapsed. Andre Hanscom, still trying to make sense of what had happened, rushed first to Wimbledon Police Station and then to nearby St George's Hospital to pick up his son. He was very quiet. He was. He wasn't saying saying anything. Um, just where's Molly? And that was with the dog. That was the, his main concern. There was little. There was very little me point point of me explaining anything to him. Is he knew more of what happened than, than I certainly did at the time. So w when did the process begin of of Alex? You trying to get from Alex some idea of what had happened. It was that very night when Alex was asleep, when I could actually finally put him down, um, I had to give a, a full statement to the police, which was um, around several pages, which covered absolutely every detail of, of our life. 
uh, you could possibly imagine. And they made it very clear to me right there and then that, that any information that, that Alex had would be, would be absolutely crucial to them because they had virtually nothing to go on. There was no material evidence that had been left and that the task was going to be extremely difficult um, to, to, to find the perpetrator. Andre struggled to come to terms with what life would be like for him and Alex without Rachel. These were two people who were, who were completely passionate for each other, whose eyes were glued to each other day after day. And this person was absolutely his whole universe. Um, and my assumption was that he wouldn't want to go on. And I certainly didn't want to go on if he didn't want to go on. Um, so I made part of that journey back was uh, working out basically a suitable method for suicide. Uh, I had absolutely no will to go on without Rachel. You thought about committing suicide? Yeah. And because I just assumed, just as clear as that, there was no reason. There was no reason for us to continue, um, to, you know, to, to, to continue alive here. What, to end both your lives? I yes. Uh, but when you had come around that first morning, I started to explain to him that there was this issue <laughs> and it was all about what we do now, whether we go on or not. And I said, you know, see Molly, you know, our dog, she's, she's young now, but there'll be, be a time when she's old and she won't be able to run around like she does. And a day will come when she won't want to go on. And as I was saying that, he looked me in the eyes and said, I want to go on. Which was extremely... A, a young boy, Definitely. nearly three years old. Not even all. three years old. Not even three years yeah. old. Telling him he wanted to go on with yeah. his life. The murder scene appeared to throw up no clues to the killer. But one person had witnessed the murder and was seen by the police as key. The only problem, he was still a little boy. A child psychologist had been trying to coax information from Rachel's son, Alex, but without success. Then Andre had an idea. Sitting in the back of a police car coming back from one of uh, visits to a psychologist. And he was reading a book, or we were reading a book together, and he said something along the lines, fat man, fat man. And it suddenly occurred to me that this was something that he could understand. So I started to draw on a piece of paper, just simple little stick drawings, fat man, thin man. And he said, thin man. And then we have white man, black man, the white man. And just by process of elimination, just in a very few minutes, we managed to get a complete description of the, pers of, of the person and what, um, he was wearing. and what they were wearing. So we had trousers, white shirt, belt over the trousers, the colour of the trousers, the colour of the shoes, colour of the hair, cut of the hair. But suddenly you had, and the police had something to go on. Something they could use, yeah. And there's something corroborated the eyewitness descriptions that they already had that I knew nothing of. It was a massive breakthrough for the Nikel team. Alex, now just three years old, had given them vital clues to the killer. The pressure was on to catch him before he struck again. Detectives investigating Rachel Nikel's murder on Wimbledon Common had made a breakthrough in the case. Rachel's young son, Alex, the only witness to the crime, had been able to give them a description of the killer. A massive manhunt was underway. Meanwhile, 12 miles away from Wimbledon Common in southeast London, the same man had been terrorizing women. His victims were invariably women with their children. In one attack, a young mum had been raped in broad daylight on a public footpath in front of her two-year-old daughter. She was very violently grabbed from behind, restrained. There was a ligature around her neck. Um, and she was dragged into the path and beaten repeatedly uh, until he also then committed the, the offence where he raped her. Um, she was begging with him to, to stop. She was obviously very concerned for a child that was in the buggy. Um, and then he was gone. Napper had targeted the women as they were walking along a series of footpaths known as the Green Chain Walk. Police had recovered DNA from three of the victims. When detectives from the Green Chain Inquiry heard about Rachel Nickell's murder, they contacted the investigating team, convinced they were looking for the same man. We 
because of the similarity in terms of you know our victim having a child with her as well I thought that seemed like too much of a coincidence for me uh, and I know both of the senior officers uh, from our inquiry went over to uh, to speak to those dealing with the Nickel inquiry. The intimation was that they were happy that, that they weren't linked, there was a distance between them, uh, and possibly they, they had maybe suspects in mind. While detectives in the Green Chain rape investigation were convinced there was a link, those investigating the Rachel Nickel murder pursued a different line of inquiry, enlisting the help of criminal profiler Paul Britton. We just entered the era, I think Cracker had started on television with Robbie Coltrane in it. Uh, that was a fanciful role, but Paul Britton was the real thing. And clearly the police believed implicitly that he was a man who could really help them in this investigation. They asked you to come up with a psychological profile. Yes. What kind of profile did you come up with? Um, I was able to give an age range. I think it was um, probably not more than 28 or 30 years old that it would be a stranger that there would be no more than average intellect that there would be um, educational uh, unexceptional history uh, that the person would not be in a marriage that there was likely to be sexual dysfunction of one sort or another that um, the killer would be a man of course and would live either alone or at home. No reason to expect um, this person to have monster stamped all over his head. That's not the way it looks. Um, and, and a variety of other characteristics. In addition to Paul Britton's profile, police also had an artist's impression of the killer. A woman had seen a man behaving suspiciously on the common shortly before Rachel was attacked. Her description matched the one given by Alex, Rachel's three-year-old son. A second woman had seen what appeared to be the same man washing his hands in a nearby stream in the minutes after her death. When police issued this picture in a TV appeal, four people phoned in with the same name, Colin Stagg. He was arrested the next day. I told them that I was there early that morning. Um, I told them the people that I saw there and I didn't see anything or hear anything suspicious and the, the interrogation just went on for those three days. The evidence against Stagg for Rachel's murder was only circumstantial but behind the scenes journalists were being told by police that Colin Stagg was still their man. We talked to the cops and the cops said it must be Colin Stagg. We went back and said to our editors it's Colin Stagg. You know the cops you know, would tell us again, we, we've got some, you know, we've got another reason for thinking it's Colin Stagg, but actually that would be because they'd heard from a different reporter, oh, it's Colin Stagg. And the whole thing became cyclical. But there was no evidence, so the Rachel Nickel team hatched a plan, aided throughout by profiler Paul Britton. They used an attractive undercover policewoman, codenamed Lizzie James, to strike up a relationship with Stagg in the hope the 29-year-old virgin would incriminate himself. The key guidance, the key advice given, was that you, the police, must at no stage introduce material. So that if there is the introduction of um, offensive material, sexual material, into the correspondence, that must come from your suspect. All you may do is, if something is introduced, you may reflect it back. So if something is said, then you can, you can then say that back. But what you must not at any stage do is you mustn't ratchet it up. I fell into that trap of writing these letters. And the more letters I wrote of a sexual nature, I kept putting in each one, <clears throat> I kept putting in each, each one, is this what you want? Is this what you're interested in, you know? And I was basically trying to find out what was really going to turn her on, you know. And it didn't, didn't matter what I wrote, you know, it just wasn't you know, doing it for her. She wanted more, more and more, more extremes, you know. After more than three months of exchanging letters, Lizzie James and Colin Stagg finally began talking on the phone. The conversation turned to Rachel's murder. I was suspected of it, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to tell, tell you, like I told everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I've never done anything, you know. 
But, you know, I was frightened of telling that right from the beginning because, uh, you know, because a lot of people do suspect I did it. Did it, and, uh, mm. playing on my mind, you know. Because oh. what were the rumours, well, that went, that went with it, and that. The pair arranged to meet in Hyde Park. The day before, Paul Britton had sat down with Lizzie James. She was advised to reveal she had a dark secret. Uh, managed to get out of her what her so-called dark secret was, and she uh, had confessed to me, you know, that um, she was involved with another man who was a Satanist, and they were involved in satanic rituals, and it turned her on sexually, and she even admitted to killing an innocent woman on an, on an altar with, you know, a pregnant woman, and then killing the baby as well. And all I kept thinking about was, um, um, well, basically, she's a good-looking woman, and that, yeah, I didn't believe a word she said, you know. I just thought she wasn't all there, she was mentally unstable. But undercover officer Lizzie James's confession of murder didn't elicit a confession of murder from Stagg. She, Lizzie James, was egging him on, and he wasn't um, coming up with the answers that the police and you and Lizzie James wanted, was he? I had no answers that I wanted. I mean, it, it, is a, it, it was if you like, from a, a technical point of view, a matter of indifference, whether or not the man gave answers that took the case forward in the police's way or eliminated. That's so you weren't convinced at this stage that Colin Stagg was the murderer of Rachel McKell? My uh, comment to the police and the Crown, um, the QCs and others, was that even if your suspect, Colin Stagg, goes all the way through this and at every step of the way meets every criteria that I have suggested would be present in the killer, but not present in someone who isn't the killer. If every single one of those is met, that doesn't make him a murderer. But police were convinced Colin Stagg was the murderer. On August the 17th, 1993, the decision was made to arrest him. Tonight, several police forensic experts moved into Colin Stagg's neat garden in southwest London and started digging deep holes. At Wimbledon Police Station, the investigating team presented Colin Stagg with the evidence gathered during the undercover operation. The increase in deviance, the increase in domination, the increase in violence, the need to humiliate and dominate. Stagg was about to realize that the woman he had been meeting wasn't a potential girlfriend, she was an undercover policewoman. Do you remember this letter now, Paul? The man then goes over to his pile of clothes and produces some string and a knife. Up until this point in time, I had never mentioned a fantasy with a knife with you. Up until this point in time, I had never mentioned a fantasy to you. Do you remember that? And you told me the police had shown you photographs of how Rachel Nicole was lying at the time she was murdered. And you, in fact, lay down in that position. You lay down like a baby, like this. Do you remember? And you curled and you had your hands like this. And you told me that her head was tilted back slightly, like this. Do you remember? Do you remember that, Colin? I knew then I was, was really being set up. And the police were doing everything they possibly can to get this case against me. And all I kept thinking about was, well, it's a murder charge, you know, you've got to have one scrap of evidence. And there was not one scrap of evidence linking me to this crime or any crime because I hadn't done anything. I thought, you can't put a man in prison just because he wrote dirty letters to a woman who asked him of him. But Colin Stagg was charged with the murder of Rachel Nickel. Police called her partner, Andre Hanscom, now living in France with his son, Alex, to break the news. What were your thoughts then? that this was finally over? R relief. That this was going to come to some kind of conclusion much earlier than many people had uh, you know, had led me to believe. Conf you know, confusion and bewilderment as well. Um, because obviously it's another whole process to try and absorb. First of all, you have you know, the very day itself and now you have the actual concrete realization that this is the person that did it. Except it wasn't. Rachel's real killer was the same man who had been raping women along the Green Chain Walk. 
Another link between the two cases was Paul Britton, the criminal profiler for both investigations. It was common sense, in my view, um, that they were linked. Uh, and yet you've got a professional psychologist saying they're not linked. Uh, and that's why probably he got the reception that he got when he came and, and briefed our team because um, um, I saw him and I know some of the others that I spoke to saw him as valueless. But today, Paul Britton says he did make a link. The thing that struck me about the psychological profile is how similar it was to the one that had been provided for the Rachel McKell case. I mean, it's not identical because people do things in slightly different ways at slightly different points in their lives. Um, but my view was that these two are so similar that you're looking at the same person. And that person wasn't Colin Stagg, it was this man, Robert Knapper, one of Britain's most notorious serial killers. Robert Knapper is a modern day Jack the Ripper. There are the sexually sadistic elements. There's the consistent use of a knife and the pleasure in using a knife. There's similar aspects to the behaviors in uh, targeting victims. And a central difference in that targeting is whilst the Ripper attacked prostitutes, Robert Knapper attacked young mums. But three years before Rachel Nickell's death, there had been the first in a series of police blunders, which meant Robert Knapper had slipped through their grasp. In 1989, uh, after I think the first rape in the Green Chain series, a woman who was Robert Knapper's mother went to the police and said, my son has confessed to me that he's raped a woman. It was true that a rape had taken place and that Knapper had done it, but the police were given the wrong location for it. So when they consulted their records, they thought, mm, this is very odd, we don't have a report of a rape in this location. And he was about to slip through the net again after police issued an e-fit of the Green Chain Rapist in August 1992, both a neighbour and a work colleague of Robert Knapper called police. They wanted him to come into the police station to give a DNA sample. Now, had, that done, had he done so, then that would have been game over. They would have known straight away that he actually was a rapist and the whole sequence of events could have been stopped. But, in fact, what happened was Robert Knapper declined to come in and uh, give a DNA sample. So once again, you know, the police very, in a very, what appears to be a very lackadaisical way, suddenly thought, oh, here's a chap who should have come in, but he's twice failed to show it for appointments to do this. Well, we'll send some people around to knock on his door. So two fairly junior officers went round, knocked on his door, had a chat with him, decided there and then that anyway, on description, he looked to be two or three inches too tall to be the man being described in these rapes. And, you know, in fairly uh, summary circumstances, they decided, well, it can't be him anyway. This catalogue of mistakes was about to cost another young mum and her daughter their lives. By the summer of 1993, the Green Chain investigation, starved of resources, was losing momentum. Meanwhile, the energies of the Rachel Nickell investigation were focused on the wrong man, Colin Stagg. He was awaiting trial at Wandsworth Prison. It meant Robert Knapper, Rachel Nickell's real killer, was on the loose. And he was about to kill again. Detectives investigating the murder of Rachel Nickell on Wimbledon Common thought they had found her attacker. Colin Stagg was behind bars and awaiting trial. But Rachel's real killer was planning his next attack. He'd already committed a series of rapes in the months before Rachel's death. Now, with police focused on Colin Stagg's trial, he was stalking his next victim. Samantha Bissett lived with her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine, just a mile away from Robert Knapper. One day, she complained to her boyfriend, Conrad Ellum, that she'd seen a man watching her late at night. Looking back, it, it seems crazy that I didn't react more at the time, I suppose. Uh, Sam had actually said this. One night, she looked in and there'd be someone looking in through the window. And then it didn't happen again. I, mean, I, was, I, um, I made a point of being around more at the time, afterwards. Weeks later, Conrad discovered a scene of unspeakable horror. As soon as I opened the door, there's a big sort of stain on the carpet, a big dark stain. I look at that and think, you know, what's, what's going on here? And I thought, well, maybe someone's got a spell. I couldn't think what. I think, 
paint or varnish or something like that. Or, and I thought, well, maybe go and try and find something to clean up with. So I went in the kitchen, and all, there was a cupboard in the kitchen with Sam used to keep her clothes. And that had been pulled open, all the clothes had been pulled out, and the whole kitchen floors were carpeted with Sam's clothes. I thought, well, that's, that's, even, that's just as strange as the carpet. I mean, what's going on? And I stood there for quite a while, looking at all these clothes and the stain, and thinking, oh, they'd been burgled or what? I didn't know what it was. And I um, walked from the kitchen, there's a, like, a hallway, and then they walked into the living room. And sort of Sam, Sam was there. I mean, she was mostly covered up. I didn't, you know, I didn't really see anything particularly traumatic. I've read the descriptions of, you know, what Robert Napper did to her, but because he covered her up with all clothes and blankets and things, there wasn't really much to see. Just sort of her arms and legs sticking out. But I think I realised, obviously then I realised what had happened. And uh, I thought, well, I'd better, better find the police. And it was only when I was out of the room that I was, it occurred to me that I hadn't seen Jasmine. I thought, is Jasmine in there? Or... And I didn't want to go back into the room to look for Jasmine. I thought, well, no, it's, I can stay out of that room now. So I looked in the bedroom and Jasmine was in, in the bed. But there again, her duvet was covered, pulled over her. So, you know, but it didn't look as if she was breathing. Detective Superintendent Mickey Banks was one of the first officers on the scene. As I walked through the door, there was people inside the house, people who had first gone to the scene, and uh, I walked through to the dining room, and this body was displayed. I mean, it was the most horrendous scene I've ever seen in 32 and a half years police service. It was awful. You know, uh, it was as if a post-mortem had been conducted on this poor young girl. It was absolutely horrendous. Samantha had been stabbed to death before being mutilated. Her daughter Jasmine had been sexually assaulted and smothered. It later emerged the killer had even taken away part of Samantha's body as a trophy. Conrad, initially considered a suspect, appealed directly to the killer at a press conference soon after the murders. If you're out there, which I think you probably are, could you possibly write to me via the police or something and tell me why you did it? There were now three separate teams at the Metropolitan Police investigating the crimes of Robert Knapper. The Rachel Nickell team had targeted the wrong man. Colin Stagg was behind bars on remand. Officers from the Green Chain team had interviewed Robert Knapper but failed to get the DNA sample that would have connected him to the rapes. Now Mickey Banks at the Samantha and Jasmine Bissett inquiry wondered if their killer and the Green Chain rapist could be the same man. It was uh, quite obvious to me uh, and a lot of people that could, could our rapists have turned into a murder, which is quite a normal event for a, a, a serial killer or a serial rapist, that he progressively gets worse and worse and more violent. Mickey Banks decided to enlist the help of a criminal profiler. It was the same man who had worked on the Green Chain rapes and the Rachel Nickell investigation, Paul Britton. And exactly what Paul Britton said to us was what my officers believed was the person responsible, was a person that didn't relate to women, who was a bit of a loner, perhaps uh, was had minor previous offences before of low intellect. And this is the normal thing that you seem to get from clinical psychologists or, and psychiatrists. There was nothing new to me. But armed with this profile, Mickey Banks and Paul Britton made a television appeal for information about Sam and Jasmine's murders. In an unusual move, Paul Britton appealed directly to the killer to contact him. I would also like him to tell me why it was necessary for him to harm the child as well. When you say you'd like him to tell you, I mean, he's not very likely to ring out and say, go speak to Paul Britton, please, Here's, here are his answers. Or is he? I think that there is a possibility that he might want to do that. But the killer didn't call. During the early days of the investigation, Mickey Banks was not only exploring links with the Green Chain Rapes, he linked up with the Rachel Nickell team at the Met. We had a meeting. There was no way that you could persuade either Keith Pedder or Mick Wickerson, the person in charge of that inquiry, that anybody but Stagg had done their murder. There was a total blank on it. They had other evidence I wasn't, uh, I wasn't privy to. But they, you know, Paul Britton was convinced that Stagg was their murderer. 
But Paul Britton says he did link Rachel Nickell's murder with the murders of Sam and Jasmine Bissett. He says it was the Rachel Nickell team who were fixed on Stag. My view was that, of course, these are linked. Look, the view that was given to me was that um, if I felt that my experience in these matters, my investigatory expertise, I think the phrase was, uh, was superior to that of the Metropolitan Police with its massed experience in these matters, and I took a view that was contrary to their crime analysts, then it would be arrogant of me and that they simply weren't linked. It was as simple as that. And I had to accept that. But there is a problem here, because in your book, you pick out the differences in the Samantha Bissett and the Rachel Nickell um, killings. You're very clear that uh, <coughs> you, you spend a page or two pages outlining the differences well, what I in, do, in, in the two killings. Yes. So, so why do you say you're linking them so closely oh, now? Because what I offer in the book is exactly the police analysis, and I have adopted that at that stage. Um, the police have said that... So you've I'm been persuaded by the police? Well, instructed, persuaded, yes, absolutely. Meanwhile, back at the Samantha and Jasmine Bissett murder investigation, Mickey Banks was about to get the breakthrough he desperately needed. They had been able to recover a fingerprint from Samantha's flat that they were convinced belonged to the killer. And when they checked their system, they found a possible match. Robert Napper. Napper, a couple of years before, had been arrested here where he had, he had some headed note paper with Scotland Yard heading on it. And he'd gone into a shop trying to get some photostats made up of this headed note paper. He purported uh, on his uh, verbal uh, conversation he had with the chap in the, in the shop to be a police officer. And the, the chap became very suspicious, contacted the police station, I think it was at Woolwich at the time, or Plumstead, and Napper was subsequently arrested and charged with impersonating a police officer. So consequently, his fingerprints were on file. So because of that and the, the fingerprint that was found, there was only a, a hint that it could be him, but it could be one of many, many people. But then we researched him, found out that he lived in the area. We then found out about his connection with the rapes, the fact that he twice failed to appear for a, a, a blood sample, Napper was arrested and taken in for questioning by a member of Mickey Banks' team. Banks and Paul Britton watched the interview via video link in another room at the station. My impression of uh, watching the interview that, that took place was that he was bombproof. He, he, he just didn't seem to be of this world to me. He was somebody that thought he was above all of it. A very strange, deep individual. You know, uh, there's just something wrong with him. You could, you could feel it by talking to him and, and, and seeing him. There was something missing. In May 1994, Mickey Banks charged Robert Napper with the murders of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett. Napper was later charged with two rapes and two attempted rapes following the attacks on the Green Chain Walk. While Robert Napper was remanded in custody, Colin Stagg was about to be released. In September 1994, the case against him was thrown out after the judge deemed the honey trap evidence inadmissible. My life has been ruined by a mixture of half-baked psychological theories and some stories written to satisfy the strange sexual requests of an undercover police officer. The judge recognised that there was never any evidence against me, no forensic evidence, no confession evidence, nothing at all. I was there when the judge l reviewed the evidence and absolutely castigated the prosecuting authorities, and it was the most uh, appalling event, I think, for the police. I don't think the police even, or the Crown Prosecution Service, anticipated the ferocity of the judge's criticisms. Um, he absolutely tore them apart and, and said to them, essentially, you know, it's a disgrace that you've brought this case. Uh, there's not a shred of evidence here. I'm not even going to contemplate putting it before a jury. You know, it's a waste of time. How on earth did the police get into such a fiasco around this? You know, not only have they apparently pursued an entirely innocent man, but in doing so, they've wasted all this valuable time that could have been used finding out who really murdered Rachel Nickel. Rachel's partner, Andre Hanscom, was at home in France with his son, Alex, when he heard the news. I was taken by complete surprise when the phone rang and I was told that uh, it had been kicked out and that uh, Colin Stagg would walk free. 
But you, like the police and like many other people, <coughs> were still convinced that Colin Stagg was the guilty man and he was now free. I think we've been conditioned psychologically from the very beginning by the idea that whoever killed Rachel was of a certain description. And that description had been provided by eyewitness adult witnesses and had then been corroborated by a three-year-old child who could not have been led in any way whatsoever. And the argument was that if it was not this person, it had to be someone who was a complete identical twin, and that was just impossible. So the very fact that Stagg had been identified there was enough on top of those things to, 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 to close you in to a box in which it was impossible to think you know, that could have been any other possibility. Rachel's father also found it difficult to come to terms with the court's decision. The law has been upheld, but where is the justice? I understand that the police will now keep the files on my daughter's murder open, but they are not looking for anyone else. Colin Stagg, as far as the police were concerned, was still the man who got away with murder. I can tell you at first hand that many police officers were saying, well, Colin Stagg's a lucky boy, he's got away with it. You know, we've, we've, we've tied ourselves in knots here and it's benefited him, but uh, really and truthfully, there isn't anybody else. And I know that Colin Stagg was kept under constant surveillance for probably at least a year after that event. Back in 1994, it seemed Rachel Nichols' killer would never be identified. It would take a DNA breakthrough more than a decade later to finally bring her killer to justice. In 1995, the loner police thought had killed Rachel Nichols on Wimbledon Common was a free man. But Rachel's real killer was about to be sentenced for two separate murders and a series of attacks on women. A serial sex attacker was sent to Broadmoor indefinitely today for killing a young woman and her four-year-old daughter. He admitted manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. For some, the root of Napper's offending lies in his troubled childhood in Plumstead, South East London. Bill Peake was a classmate of the young Robert Napper. Robert was a very quiet lad, very shy lad, um, a bit of a loner, really. He never really fit, fitted into any of our social groups. Um, he was very much on his own during his school years. It wasn't a school where there was particular, I'd say, particular levels of bullying, but where there was bullying, Robert was, was often a target of that bullying. Um, and that bullying could be both from sort of the boys or the, and the girls, really. Um, so, yeah, he was a very vulnerable, very shy young lad, really. We know that Napper was taken to a psychiatrist when he was very young, and he uh, reported uh, to his father that the psychiatrist said, I'm mad, Dad, and found it quite amusing. That, alongside another feature that is common in these sorts of very violent men, is that at an early age, and certainly pre-puberty, they've been assaulted by someone that's very close to them. And in Napa's case, we don't know who it was, but there are some indications that this person was someone that he trusted. <laughs> It seemed that Robert Napper had got away with Rachel's murder, but a revolution in DNA technology meant that in 2004, police were able to recover his DNA from evidence gathered from Rachel's body 12 years earlier. They compared the, the, those components with a list of profiles from the top 40 suspects. And in going through, um, we eliminated 39 of them, including Colin Stagg, but the one person that they all matched was Robert Napper. Roy Green and his team were then asked to examine a red toolbox belonging to Napper. We remembered that we'd found some red paint in the hair of Alex Hanscom, the little boy. And so we thought, well, we'd we better compare these. And when we compared them, we found that the paint in Alex Hanscom's hair matched into the toolbox. The police now knew Robert Napper was the killer. It was too much to, to really take in. There's now 14 years down the line, and 
so many of those years continually being herded along one corridor, um, waiting in limbo, as you say, but waiting for the phone call for when this is finally confirmed and finally put to rest to be suddenly thrown 180 degrees the other way. After 16 years in limbo, Andre Hanscom finally got to court to see the man who killed his beloved Rachel admit his guilt. Alex and I have had to share our home with a monster. We've had to come to terms and that monster's lost power over the years. But everything to do with his trauma, everything to do with my upset, everything to do with our relationship, everything to do with our families, everything to do with where we found ourselves was as a direct result of an extremely powerful entity that had caused wreaked havoc in our lives. And it wasn't the physical manifestation, I suppose, that I expected to go together with, with, with all that we've been through. Napa pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He was ordered to be detained indefinitely at Broadmoor Top Security Hospital, where he's been since 1995. At last, Colin Stagg received an apology from the Metropolitan Police. It is clear that he is completely innocent of any involvement in that case. And I today apologize to him for the mistakes that were made in the early 1990s. It took 16 years for Rachel Nickell's killer to be brought to justice. If the initial investigation into her death hadn't focused on Colin Stagg, could Robert Knapper have been caught before he killed Samantha and Jasmine Bissett? Mr Justice Ogdall said that uh, Paul Britton was pulling the strings. He said that this operation was sustained in constant consultation with the psychologist, the policewoman was acting under orders, and the police in their turn were being guided by the psychologist. The judge can only be guided by whatever paperwork the judge had, and it's not for me to make um, criticisms of the judge beyond saying it's not correct. Today, Paul Britton is a university lecturer. Colin Stagg has since received £700,000 in compensation. Lizzie James, the undercover officer, received £125,000 in an out-of-court settlement after complaining her career had been ruined by the case. Officers from the original investigation declined to take part in this program. Andre has dedicated the last 17 years to rebuilding his and his son's lives. What sort of lad has he grown into? He's a lovely boy, but uh, if you ask any father that, <laughs> they're only going to say the same. And I think that's where my greatest satisfaction comes, as far as Alex is concerned. There are many ways his life was written off. He was, the headline said, tragic tot, blighted life. This was what was expected for him. And that we've, made, we've been able to turn that around, that by believing that things can be better, and that uh, we made things different. Are you proud of what you've done for your son? Mm. Um, I'm relieved and grateful to have been able to have got through and to have achieved what I set out to achieve. Um, I'm very proud of him and I'm beginning to feel proud of myself. Do you talk about Rachel much of him? I've always tried to keep it as natural, the conversations as natural as possible, that her presence is as important now as it was before and then it become an, uh, a question of taboo and a difficult subject. So yes, she gets mention mentioned regularly. And just finally, what's your abiding memory of, of Rachel? I think that's the best question to the last. A smile. A smile. She had a wonderful smile and the smile was full of, full of intelligence and good humour. <laughs>